disclaimer, this is the first time I've shown work on Zoom through screen share, so I'm pretty nervous about it, but it's also a really good opportunity for me to look back on my practice and see how, even though I didn't have a plan, um, my intuition has kind of led me to build on some of my previous work and to this new one in a way that I think is, is a good step forward and sometimes can happen. Um, so I'm going to begin with uh, the interview and intimates strand and what I mean by intimates is my personal relationships so my family and friends and uh, that happened really by chance when I was at Goldsmiths and uh, at Christmas time one year I just I got a camera and my uncle visited us and I was filming him and basically it was the first time that the camera acted as a sort of tool that allowed me to question something that I had just taken for granted. So I'm going to show a clip from the film. The film was seven minutes long. Um, let me see how this works. <laughs> so. You know how your childhood is, your happiest days? When I first met Miriam at school when we were five, the fun we had. And then we, she went to St Charlotte Street and went to St Mungo's and we split up at 12. We got back on the bus for 17 and when we were 17. And I used to see her pray to meet her every day, going to school. And she used to see her pray to meet me every day. And I was a right tosser, I wouldn't shut up and she wouldn't talk. But um, she asked me out one time, and I had no money to take her out. You know? I was wearing my shirt for the barras, one of them cheap ones, and it was the only shirt I had, and it was green. And my neck was all green. And she was laughing at me, is that green, your neck? She said, I, I said, I bought it for the barras. My neck was all, you're green dye. Uh, uh... Uh, she came with me the day John got married. I didn't go to John's wedding and I met her in Connemara and we conceived a child. Well, the thing is, about the difference is that Danny's got a fixed hallucination and Danny's is a fixed hallucination because he won't let go of it even when he gets well. The difference with mine is, as soon as I get well, I know they're all hallucinations and I know they're all delusions. I don't hang on to Bobby. I don't think I'm Bobby Sands when I get well. I might smile fondly and always think of Bobby and as the person he was, but I, I don't think I genuinely was Bobby, whereas Danny thinks he's genuinely married to Miriam. Or does he? I don't know. Does he do that for effect for the rest of us to annoy us? I don't know. I don't know. You'd only have to ask Danny that. And I don't know if he'll ever tell the truth. Danny could just carry it on just to annoy us. I don't know. But who, like, is there a Miriam? There was a Miriam. He went to school with, so she's not a complete, same way that there is a Bobby Sands. That was another thing in the hospital I went through, that do any of them people exist? Does anybody exist? Are we all a mirage? You know, all of this thing, that there's a higher order up there and that we're all little dolls and um, they were all trapped in these bodies, this wee ego, and that they're, we're, we're nothings, and that we're all destined for a higher plane, and that this is just a kind of hell we're stuck in. Um, that all sort of stuff goes through my head, which is all philosophical stuff, as well as um, just pure madness. You know? So, <laughs> the, basically that, piece was the first piece where I really decided to um, start off a work by just thrusting the audience immediately into the circumstance of the film and I felt that that was a really good way of establishing trust and immediacy right from the beginning and intimacy and that that was a good place to sort of turn it on its head so my uncle um, was very authentic and and real to the camera so it started to bring up this question of, of truth and documentary truth because then I start questioning the story that seems so so um honest 
but I wanted to move from that place of questioning a truth into something that was more universal and, and philosophical. And the lip syncing was a very simple but effective way of doing that because it was an ability to transcend the particularities of one certain person. And I have found that relationships for me are really um, great and important way to get to this universality. And I'm gonna something, I'm gonna bring in Sally Rooney at this point, cause why not? But uh, Sally Rooney, I heard her talk in one of her talks about her novels and saying basically that she doesn't write a, a novel about one individual character. She thinks of a chemistry between people and, and, and the book is really about that. And um, so that was, that's interesting for my work as well. And I really became interested in how people find themselves or lose themselves in their relationship. But I also, that is a means of making work threw up a lot of questions for me and doubt about basically using your personal relationships as material um, and the ethics of doing so, but also having this feeling in myself about the ethical cost of, of not doing so, because for me, ethic requires that you know who's who and what the relationships are and film is a very natural way for me to work that out and um, so in the next piece I did I wanted to explore authorship and also the sort of flux of subjectivity that can happen in a chemistry between two people and at the time I was uh, living in London and I was constantly surrounded by this poster it was the David Bowie's here exhibition at the V&A and it was everywhere in, in London. And I think a lot of people at the time were influenced by David Bowie, which I mean, is a good enough person to be influenced by. But um, I was just uh, really interested in this sort of universal eye that was seemed to be following me everywhere and staring at me and addressing me. Um, and I also was reading Chuck Polnick, the author of Fight Club. He had these craft essays about establishing authorship in your work and how one of the means of doing so was to basically um, use the first person narrative, but submerge the I, because the idea behind it is that people trust someone speaking from their own experience, but they hate someone who keeps saying I, 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 I in a novel. So he would just strike out the I and replace it with his name or the character's name. And I started to think, oh, how do I do this and move an image? And one of the ways of doing it was to basically, especially in, in think about, and a lot of the question could show up more about the questioner. And um, so I'm going to show you a clip from the work that I ended up doing from that time. It ends up revealing his process, uh, physicality space, even though he smokes. It shows you things he didn't intend for you to see, so... Um, in effect, it feels like you get a much truer reflection of him in the pots. Can you talk about why you're attracted to the pots? That's a difficult question. Because um, I feel like that's a, a question that's it's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> In the same way that image is really held in my head, uh, the reason I know is because I can, I can really accurately um, describe the image. That's like where it's stuck. Um, I don't know if I can. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it's more difficult to articulate why that image or those Parts have had that effect. That was a six minute film and basically it's a very banal conversation that breaks down and becomes a bit of a conflict between um, the interviewer and the subject and 
a lot of the things I was playing with in this piece were basically about blurring, merging the lines between them, um, artificiality and and the truth in some ways. So I, you could, you wouldn't be, um, you know, but it would be very easy to 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 think that that was a digital effect of two images, um, put together in After Effects. But actually everything that's filmed happened in front of the camera. So it was a latex screen um, and the film of the man was projected on the screen. And then I was interacting with the piece in real time behind it by coming in closer and touching the screen. And uh, the what's being spoken sounds very natural, but it's actually scripted. And I used the David Bowie reference or how he wrote his lyrics were basically did cut and paste. And um, I did that by taking three interviews that I have with my friend and making a script out of them into, into one coherent whole. And the guy is actually an actor. My friend who it's based on was uh, an English gentleman. So this actor, it was important to me that he was Northern Irish because we were in England at the time and it was another tactic of making it feel more intimate, making it feel more tense um, and claustrophobic and making people think that we had a relationship together. And whenever I screened it, I had one speaker on the screen where I had the male voice coming from it and then the interviewer, which is my voice coming from behind. So the viewer was trapped in the middle. Um, and there was this conflict between the two characters, but also you know, they were very much in opposition, but the image was merging in a certain way. And for me, it was important because it was about that line between um, when idolization becomes a sort of possession or uh, con consuming in some way the, the object of desire. And uh, this sort of, that was quite, I suppose, truthful to what had happened where basically I really idealized my friend speaking about a ceramicist he idealized this was quite banal but I really idealized how he spoke um, and the conference was interested in trying to capture the conversation but as the interviews went on it sort of deteriorated because he got very um, self-conscious about being recorded or being captured or being on camera and uh, it was then that I sort of realized that I find resistance quite valuable in some way as a way to sort of probe at the idea of truth and concealed truths and also as a way to situate myself uh, and also as a way to really bring to the fore um, the sort of medium specificity of filmmaking and the camera and it's this constant tension you have between its ability to like bear witness to something but also to entrap in some way um it was an interesting experience it was quite challenging and I think basically what I decided to do afterwards was um to work a bit more intuitively the next piece I did uh, had to do a lot more with landscape which brings me to this Donegal strand of my work but also a sort of acknowledgement that yeah I use the camera as a way to get closer to subjects and places. And sometimes that does mean that you rub up against their boundaries. So I actually showed that work with, it was a two screen installation. And on one side it had that um, film that I just showed you an expert in a club from. And then the other side it had a very short film that was three minutes. Um, and both of them had similar themes about morphing and merging, but one of them was very talky and analytical and the other one was very much action-based. The second one was basically just this idea I had about uh, digging in the bog and turning. I was, I was very, I did a lot of digging for my practice at the beginning and I wanted to go back to that. It was a digging in the bog and, and then that this sort of, um, this woman who was dressed in a fur coat, as you can see, turns and turns into me. So it was actually my mother. What was quite funny at the time was that we looked very like each other and nobody realized that it was two different people, <laughs> which was a mistake I learned from. Um, and also what was interesting was um, they thought that I'd shot it in, in the Rockies, 
in America, and it was Donegal, so I really loved that. Um, but that was something that was just very intuitive and, and felt like experimenting and having an image and just going out and, and doing it. And that was something that I came back to four years later um, in this work, Fox Cry, that I did. This was a work I did in 2018. And again, it was basically dealing with um, using Donegal as a, as a place, a sort of space, an intimate space where you could just, um, you could go and you could play and you could work just intuitively, like I said, and you could take risks and do secretive things. And the idea behind it at the time, I was reading the feminist magazine, Salt. They were, it's a bunch of girls who um, had, set the magazine up while they were in Goldsmiths and they had this issue called Touch Me Not which was um, dealing looking at art history through the lens of um, a feminist lens particularly taking into account that biblical story of um, the oh sorry don't know what happened there <laughs> um Anyway, I can, I can just talk myself and I'll show you the next book. But yeah, using the biblical story of Mary Magdalene and, and how she, whenever Jesus had written, or risen, she tried to touch him and he says, you know, do not touch me. And, and basically they said about the issue that um, they quoted Anne Carson and said, what do we desire when we desire other people, not then something else? And they said, it is in this void that we are trying to grasp at. The issue aims to overthrow the privileging of the visual in favor of the sensorial. It is an inherently feminist art practice to muddy the translation between the seeable and the sayable. The parasitic nature of love, lust, and touch are examined throughout. Freud's aphorism touches the first act of possession, hovers over the issue like a threat. So when I was reading this, the first thing that came to me was basically the boy racers in Donegal and how when they did the donuts on the road, it felt to me like a very visual act of possession of the landscape and I started to have this question of well what would it mean to repossess that landscape in the most sensorial visceral tactile way and I was like well you know you could just lick it so <laughs> I just decided to go on this mission to basically find these donuts in in Donegal and while I was dri driving up the back roads around Errigal which is where I knew that they often went I came across this sort of field of lights and I'd never seen it I didn't know it was there and um, and this was where I basically ended up making the film which I'm going to sh show a clip from and that's where the still came from as well the I when I was up there doing this video I was photographing myself at the same time But so um basically that was uh me messing around and testing something out but I was doing the fire station uh, digital residency at the time and it was a really good opportunity to um, mess around with the, this great piece of equipment they had called Viper where basically you could move the sound around the room so I used uh, the Fox's mate and cry because it had this sort of visceral mix of violence and desire and I've heard it's said that that's where the banshee, the, 
that's where the band that that is the sound that banshees make or there's a, a crossover that some people think that it's actually fox fox cries um and really that piece the reason the the lights the light field is a fish farm so i find that out whenever i was asking about it it's these artificial strobe lights that basically stop the fishes from reaching the sexual maturity that would actually decrease their commercial value which i felt really echoed with what i was interested in or where what it sparked me to make the work in the first place which was my experience um of being a teenage girl and going to see you and Gidor and basically coming out in the middle of the night and being completely bashed by the elements because you're wearing top shop fur and, and heels and you're dependent on these other young males who basically can drive and how you are both sort of trapped in, in these trappings of trying to be sexually mature but actually they're limited in some way and um, now I think that's a lot for what actually was a test piece and I mean it, it work it does its own thing it has a surreal quality but these are things I'm really interested in and something I wanted to make a short film about for a long time looking at the sort of complexities of of teenage desire and using locals from the area but that's something that I still hope to do um so I'm going to move on to the third strand that I was talking about which is the psychological cinema um, because that piece dealt with fashion and female sexuality in, in a way that I also addressed in this piece called Star Factory, which was a two-minute film. And I'm going to show like a very, very short clip from it. I think it's, it's online, and if you'd like to watch it, you can, but I'm just going to show a short clip from online. <sighs> started from basically I'd taken a break from making any art and was back in Derry for a while and was hanging out in Weller Spoons with my friends and became really fascinated by the girls in there and how out of place they looked because they looked so glamorous and they were wearing these incredible warrior-like outfits but we were in Weller Spoons and it was the middle of winter and um, so I started photographing them. It was the first time I ever done photography and I was really out of my comfort zone. And a lot of times I would take refuge in the girls' toilets. And that's when I began, began to observe the interactions between them. And that's where this film came from. Um, I was researching the socio-political history of Derry with the shirt factories and thinking about the matriarchal relationship of of the women and the clothing as empowerment because they were often the breadwinners at the time but I also was just really interested in idealization and projection and this desire for initiation for this young woman and I think it harked a lot back to that piece I showed the portrait of the craftsman in, in a lot of ways because it was about idealization but also using this um technique of like one shot and also this process I have of, of documenting something first and then using cinematic form to sort of explore the psychology behind it. Um, and I was realizing as well another strand in, in my work was this mix between like a bleak reality and this idealization and fantasy and how people try to survive or elevate or escape um, in some way out of their reality through fantasy. Um, 
that's really relevant to the work I'm doing now. The, the one thing I would say in, in terms of the work in between was I, I made a fiction film with my friends. Um, well, one of my friends acted in it and she was a revelation, but it was a fictionalized film and it was the first time I'd made a fully fiction film and I made a lot of mistakes, but um, it was a really, it was, it was a, a, a big uh, learning process because I got to use um, 16 mil for the first time. And I got to basically work with using mixed formats to show these different types of, um, of modes you know, like a bleak reality and an, and an idealization and maybe it might rupture or fail in some way. And then whenever I did this show in RCC and Letterkenny, I was able to basically bring back in the interviewing. Um, I interviewed my friend. So it was this three screen installation and um, you walked in the middle of it and basically you were in between these through this relationship and, and you could never get the full picture. Um, so I felt like that was more successful in showing what I was trying to get at and that leads really to where I'm at now. So where I'm at now is basically I've been working on this film for a while. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show a three minute clip from it. People may have seen it before but I, hope, I, don't, th I don't think that many people have here so that's good. Um, I'll show that and then I'll just talk about that briefly. Hello? It's my red. Huh? What? You'll see me in 50 minutes? Huh? Yeah, I've always had the... A, a flag? A fag? I, I don't have any fags. No, I fell in, I fell in. Fell in, yeah. You're as bad as your mum. What? You're as bad as your mum with your hearing. I am like, I'm bad as my mum with my hearing, yeah, I know. I used to live in here. Did you? This is my room. No, it's my room. Huh? This is my room. Uh, so 
again, from what I was saying earlier, um, I'm hoping this is going to be one of the uh, first kind of scenes in the film. Um, and it's using that thing, this tactic that I have in my work of kind of just grabbing the viewer and, and taking them with me by the hand um, and using one shot in order to build trust and immediacy and make something very immersive. And the film basically is a experimental hybrid personal film. It's the first feature work that I'm working on. Um, it's about inheritance and it's set in Gorda Hork and Donegal. And it mixes these very observational documentary footage like you just seen with um, 16 mil cinematic um, sequences. Um, the latter is used to basically visualize what will be the central haunting theme of the film um, that we're damned to inherit our parents' lives. So I, sorry, I don't, I've been talking a bit longer than I had planned, but I was gonna show you basically a, a small clip of, that shows the second half, the more cinematic sequences, but if you want, you can ask me about that in the Q and A because I'm aware of time. There's a lot of the camera sort of elevating like a a, spect a sort of a ghost-like presence. And I find it really interesting when Sarah Duffy was doing her talk about her residency in um, Dunry, she was talking about ghosts and history rubbing up against itself and, and that, and how Dunry is a really unique site for that. So um, for me, it's sort of the perfect place to be looking at this material and thinking about how a ghost would edit it, because in some ways, the idea of a ghost in myself, being a filmmaker, being a ghost in some way, because I'm haunting both my family by asking these questions and myself by asking these questions. And um, it feels like the ideal to edit the interviews um, and think about how to jump time, because I don't see this film being chronological. It's very much playing with different time periods and um, and the edit is quite strong and associative in that way. Um, and then the landscape in Don, Don Ray is just so useful for me because what's been a huge influence on this work is um, I read that book by Nancy Shepherd Hughes called um, Schizophrenic Saints and Scholars in Ireland, in rural Ireland. Uh, and basically she was an anthropologist and she did this study in West Cork. She named the town Valley Brand, but that was just a pseudonym for the town. And it was in the seventies that she did this study and looking at why there was such a high level of alcoholism and schizophrenia and, um, and these towns, these rural towns. And what I found really interesting when reading the book was that I've never been to West Cork and I wasn't there in the 1970s, definitely not, but it felt so familiar to me and yet so distant in some way. And it gave me a really interesting frame to reflect back on Gorda Hork and where I grew up. And I feel like that when I go to Inishowen because I grew up in Donegal and so the landscape is so familiar to me, but it's completely alien because I don't, I don't know the place. Um, I, I mean, it looks like my place, but it's not. And so it gives me this really interesting space of like disassociation in order to rethink about this work. And what I proposed for the residency in particular was to focus on a very experimental edit of basically looking at the house because the film's all about this house and the fallout of the inheritance of this house and what it meant and what it symbolized, even though it's not really the value is in money, it's more psychological. And um, I think it's quite a, a, it's a known story in Ireland. It feels quite Irish to me. Um, but I was interested in looking at how, in different ways of editing the film as a kind of besieged fort. And Don Reilly was perfect for that because it is a fort and also it has all those um, outbuildings dwellings. I actually did a music video there a couple of years ago and it was amazing. <laughs> so that was what I'm hoping to look at and um, to be quite isolated when I'm there and a lot of the research to just be really loved from being in that place and editing. And um, I thought it'd be a really good time to reflect on an ethics that is, isn't based on distance but 
on engagement and in particular that saint that old Irish saying um Erskaya Kela Wadris Nadini in the shadows of each other we must build our lives and that's what I'm hoping to do with this work just to ask like in what ways do we belong to each other and uh what is the cost of that belonging so I'm sorry I went a bit over time I I'm just going to blame you for and the fact that the clips are long, but I am ready to see anybody and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Myra. That was, um, yeah, that was fascinating. Um, and I have loads of questions. And um, and so because I'm the host, I get to just jump in. <laughs> but before I do that, I just want to say that to everybody that we are recording this. So in a wee minute, um, you will be able to turn on your um, video. And uh, if you want to ask a question, if you write ask in the chat box, if you don't want to ask it yourself, you can just write the question in the chat box. So have a think and either write ask or write the question and I'll find you and, uh, and, and address that question. Oh, loads of really great comments here. Um, uh, oh, are you a fan of Rashomon? My rich. You've seen that? I don't know what that is. is that... <laughs> I think probably need to look it up. Is it's a film? Is it? Is it is, is a, it's a film, right? Yeah. Uh, Martha, can you enlighten us? Oh, hello. Oh, there. Yes, it's a yeah, film. Yeah, it's a Japanese film from different perspectives in one event. I think it, I've seen an advertisement for it, but I haven't watched it, but I will, I'll definitely check it out now. Um, yeah, I, I was looking to do more research into this Asian idea of, um, I don't know how to say it properly, but like anime, they, they have these spirits. I think you can see it in Uncle Bonamy, this idea that objects and places have, have a spirit of themselves. And I was looking at, at potentially doing more research into that um, because I'm gonna do more filming around the house and the landscape. And I thought that that would be a really good way about looking at ghosts. Oh, Cleon is saying it's Shintoism, animism. Yes, animism. Yes, that's it, thank you, Cleon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another uh, Bernadette Hopkins. Thank you, Myra, for take, talking about your work and art practice and processes. Very original perspectives. I really enjoyed listening and watching. Oh, Clean, this is amazing, by the way. If anyone would like to ask a question, you can write ask in the chat or you can type the question as Martha did, however you feel um, you'd like to do it. Oh, Anna Marie Nolan, how do you choose the residencies that you apply for? Mm. <laughs> I I don't actually to be fair to be honest I don't apply for that many residencies and um, I this one just felt like a real no no brainer to me because I knew Don Ree from doing the like I said I did a Saint Sister video years ago and I thought the site was it was it was just really incredible and and I know people say that and um but there is something very special about that place so I, I knew about that one and I wanted to do that and then the other one was like I, I think a lot of it's chance to be honest like I really wanted to go to India and then somebody told me about this residency to India and I was like okay <laughs> and I ended up going and it was one of the best experiences of my life and um, so that's the residencies that I've gone on and um, and it's usually just from also if if I like an artist and I think that they've done interesting work on a residency. So I've got another one, all the ones that I was spent to go to this year being put to next year. So I have another one in uh, hospital fields in Scotland next year. And um, it's because I really liked Sophie Condil's early work and I knew that she had developed a new work there. So it's usually word of mouth an artist or, or a personal relationship with a particular place. Um, so someone said, I'd I think I'd love to hear more about this idea of sensory touch versus vision and how this is gendered. Um, yeah, so basically that this Salt magazine was, um, it was building on a Chantelle Ackerman lecture 
and it was talking about how often the they, they were making the claim and the, and the issue that a lot of female work and also suppose specifically the background of performance work did have this very bodied um, visceral approach to practice and could be very like chaotic and messy and in a great way and it was happening very much at the time when you had um, you know uh, minimalism and and other works, I mean, there was also work by Bruce Neumann and things as well that had that element, but there was this real elevation of works that were more cerebral, that were placed in art galleries that were very much like, you can't touch these and this is this great work of art. Whereas the sensorial was far more about the feeling of something and, and that's what they were exploring in that issue. Um, and the, also the idea of like female excess of like things just being a bit too much. So they do a lot of writing and a lot of poetry. Um, and I think I just really liked that particular issue of the magazine because, because it did bring that to the fore. Um, and it was using that biblical reference of those, those paintings and Jesus basically saying, you don't need to touch me to believe in me. You can see me and sight is enough. Um, and this division they were claiming between sight and feel and how sight was far more like the male artist and the feel was the female per the female artist perspective. And um, I mean, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's nothing's ever as simple as that, but it was an interesting idea. <laughs> and that's enough for me to get going on, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm like you're just when you're talking there and getting like images of like Eva Hess and her approach, you know, especially like alongside the kind of minimalism and how kind of uh, tactile and visceral her work was, uh, like uh, along with a lot of other like um, artists, well, female artists and, and well, as you say, it's 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 never there's never like a straight line. It's never black and white, but it is an interesting concept. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah I, have, I have so many things to ask you and I don't want to be hogging it so please do if anybody has something to ask and um, do feel free you can I think you can put it on your um, your videos maybe I'll ask you to put on your videos so I can see you but what I was going to ask you was Myra you mentioned that you were um, involved that you did some digging at the start of your practice Tell me a wee bit about this digging that you were at and what's that all about? What it was, was about it, well, basically I started, I started art school and then within the first month of me, you know, within the first week of me starting art school, um, a very close friend of mine's mother who I'd grown up with Ireland, west of Ireland, it was Galway, Connemara, another place that has that similar distance and, and closeness and where I'd spent a lot of time every summer when I was growing up, um, I'd go down there. And during the funeral, she, my friend, she had two daughters and I was friends with them both. And one of them basically was wearing her mother's Chinese dress because her mother had been a performer and a violinist and a very exuberant character and she was wearing this Chinese dress and they have this um, tradition in Galway where basically in the in Connemara they'll the man will fill in the grave so they they bur they did this grave with all the flowers on it and uh, the men will fill it in while you're there and I'd never seen this before and my friend in her Chinese dress started doing it as well and I just, I just went back and I became obsessed with digging. <laughs> and that's where it started. Uh, um, it, it turned, I ended up, I was digging for about a year then. I was making films just of me digging into the earth with my hands. And I was looking a lot at like Beckett at the time. And, um, and I just found it to be like a really great, like it's something I think I'd probably always go back to because there's just something like so, um, like I think if you're ever having a problem with ideas or anything just go out and do something and do a lot of it is probably the thing um, 
so I was, and I was just looking at that and it was very visceral it was really um I was also looking at Camille Claudette and like Lynn Ramsey and all these films where these women go out and they dig with their hands and so that was where I, I started doing a lot of work and, and experimenting a lot with it and yeah it, it was just and then it came back up with my with my mother and the bog so I don't know if that really answers your question, but it was just a really one of those things that I ended up doing that I just felt like it was, it kind of feeds into a lot of my work, which is sort of searching for something. And sometimes it doesn't make, it doesn't matter what you find. It's just a process of looking, I suppose. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's really insightful. It's not at all what I expected. It's very, I've never heard of this, of them filling in the grave when you're there. That's very bizarre. And that must have been a really striking image to, yeah, in the, the Chinese dress. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, I think it's incredibly courageous that you work so intimately with your family will, relationships. Do you ever become overwhelmed while filmmaking? Yeah. Uh, will I read that again? I read it kind of quickly, but- No, I can see it, it's okay. Got, yeah. Oh, you can see it, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, I do get I do get overwhelmed, but and um, I think like thank you for the comment. I think filmmaking makes me more brave than I actually am because it gives me a purpose. I find it really difficult often to go into relationships whenever I don't have any purpose, and somehow when I'm making this film, I'm able to address things that I'm usually not able to because I'm like oh it's for the film <laughs> you know it's, I, I'm doing the film and I just need to do it now and it, and and I'll give it some meaning because sometimes I think it's just when you go into certain um situations and there's like a the lack of meaning can be quite difficult um I this film that I'm doing has been a quite an intense film and process for about nine months and uh, I think it, what was more intense for me was not just going into the familial relationships. It was that I was like um, carrying a lot of fear that I don't think was actually that truthful to what was happening. And I can see that now. So a lot of the early footage that I have, I think is completely unusable because it's not even like fly on the wall. It's literally like fly petrified. You might see me on the wall. It's like the camera is like on the ground and, and I've just become far more. And then I realized like nobody actually cares as much as you think they do. <laughs> like they do care, but they don't, they're, they're just, but it was a period of building up trust and I've learned a lot a lot doing it and it it has been a really really good process for me um, and as you say you've you've kind of you've taken people by the hand you know you're like you're not a fly on the wall at the same time you know you're taking people by the hand and I suppose giving people the opportunity to talk about those things as well I think um and I think like I don't know I don't mo most people here probably um I recognize as being artists um I think like that's that's what you know artists use art to make sense of of, of things and you know and and maybe avoid <laughs> uh, <laughs> intimate and familial kind of relationships and I think this is really um yeah uh yeah really um brilliant to be and um yeah and just uh, oh, can you mention any literary references or interests, if any? Really enjoyed the talk. Thanks so much. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned Sally Rooney earlier, and I, oh God, she's so good. But yeah, is there any other uh, uh, references that you want to mention? Yeah, like this is a really good question because I think what's um, what's really common for me is mainly that most of my influences are literature. <laughs> Um, and I am really interested in the sort of auto fiction strand that's happening at the minute, this, the female, this sort of female embodied lived experience, but also um, how that rubs up against this Irish tradition of Irish writers that were sort of condemned for telling what they perceive to be the truth. So when I talk about autofiction, 
I am quite picky as my friend Kiara who is here knows because <laughs> we were in a book club together and it's a lot of female autofiction and I'm basically like the most hated person in the book club usually because I'm the most uh, critical of it <laughs> but um, I really love Gwendolyn Riley and um, she absolutely adore Gwendolyn Riley um, who wrote this book First Love and she writes these very short novels that I think are so weighty and heavy and I use her as an editing reference because basically when I read her books I started thinking about how in editing you have these two modes you can basically be a censorship letter or a funnel I think in documentary editing a funnel is what most people use so for me that's basically like cutting out the, the crap and making it slim and just having the point of, of what's important and that's like so important for editing but then I think the censorship letter is what I'm using in the beginning of that three minute scene where basically there's all this text and there's bits of it that are that are um you don't see it because of the cut I showed you but basically there's bits of it that are blackened out and you as the viewer know that there's parts that I'm choosing not to show you and so it's sort of showing the audience that basically there are boundaries here and I feel like Wendell and Riley writes like that because she'll describe the scene and then I think she's like basically cut out all the processing so you have the killer line at the end but you can feel the weight of it but you can't see all the processing so I love her and then in the second like another huge influence on my work has been John McGahern and um, so particularly his first book which he wrote when he was 29 and I feel like he just went really hard and basically was like I'm going to talk about my family <laughs> now and uh, the book The Barracks I, I love that book um, and it's very like based on his own story but it's sort of fictionalized as well and um, so he's he's just like he deals with the surface of things in the most deep way so I like, adore him um, and then, yeah, so those books, all their books as well co come up whenever, like I'm reading at the minute, um, Vivian Gornick, The uh, Fierce Attachments, um, about her relationship with her mother. Um, again, wonder, amazing piece of work, amazing piece of writing. I think it was written in the 1980s. Um, and about her, her and her mother traveling around New York um, and that's incredible and has been a big influence. There was a book I read recently that was a, a big influence but I can't remember. I'd have to go on my Goodreads but yeah so those books are, are really good and I have a whole list of books that basically I'm like um, they're related to the project that I still have to read because I'm actually not the fastest reader unfortunately. Um, but yeah. Um, Anne Henderson has a question. The work you've shown us is so powerful. Absolutely, Anne. Uh, you mentioned my word. Oh, we could see more online. Oh, yeah, there was a film. Do you remember you showed us? Um, can you tell us where we can find that kind of that and more online, my word? Um, so Star Factory is online. That's like two minutes, and then a little wishbone is ten minutes. I haven't put it up yet um but probably will soon are they just on your website oh. yeah i need to update i'm updating my website this week so um and if you want to if you want to email me i'll send you any links like my emails on my website it's just basically my read at hotmail.co.uk and just aware of timing and stuff and yeah. um and i just want to just check is there any oh uh thank you your, your work and your talk have been amazing i absolutely agree it was amazing uh, journey that we've just been on uh, really really wonderful and um, yeah I'm, I'm so glad that um, I've had this this time to spend um, you know, you all applause yourselves for hanging in there as well yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you thank you so much Myra that was wonderful yeah. thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you very much I loved it yeah but, uh, it's good to see you yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for organizing this. Bye. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. Thank you for a lovely evening, and we'll yeah. see you very soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.